Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Super Selective Primers for the Multiplex Quantitation of Rare Mutant Sequences Associated with Cancer, presented by Fred Kramer, PhD. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. To learn more about LabRoots, please visit www.labroots.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This presentation has been approved for continuing educational credits. If you want to obtain the credits, please click on the Get Your Free CME, C CME CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to the Continuing Education page where you can select a speaker, click on the CE CME button, and it will take you through the process to obtain your certification. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window, type in your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll try to get to as many as we can and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Also, please note that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kramer, who is a professor of microbiology, biochemistry, and molecular genetics at Rutgers University. Dr. Kramer has been a principal investigator at the Public Health Research Institute for the past 29 years. He was on the faculty of the Department of Genetics and Development at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons for 17 years and has been a research professor and adjunct professor in the Department of Microbiology at New York University School of Medicine for the past 24 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kramer. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay. Uh, thank you, Judy, for the introduction. Uh, let me start, well, let me put the title of the talk on the screen. Uh, it's been a major goal of molecular diagnostics uh, to find a sensitive and specific means of detecting and quantifying DNA fragments that come from rare cancer cells uh, by virtue of a, of a somatic mutation that's present in those DNA fragments. Uh, the, the general problem though in making an early detection of cancer is that most of the DNA fragments in a sample come from normal cells. And so the, uh, the problem that I'm gonna be talking about today is how can you selectively identify and quantitate really rare mutant fragments that are associated with cancer. Well, th th there are, are multiple advantages of being able to do this. Uh, let's, say a, let's say that a, a patient has been treated for cancer. It's had a tumor removed or perhaps a bone marrow transplant. Uh, after the treatment is done, there is still a, a chance that cancer cells remain in that person's body. Uh, this is called the problem of minimal residual disease. And so to protect patients who might still have cancer cells in their body, uh, very strong drugs are given, which are designed to kill the remaining uh, cancer cells. Uh, the problem is that these drugs are very toxic and have serious side effects. How much better it would be if there was a method after the uh, treatment of assessing the abundance of those uh, remaining cancer cells, if any. Uh, if, if you had a sensitive method of that sort, you might not have to give uh, these toxic drugs. Uh, I mean, once you have such a method, clinical studies could be done to see at, at what level of remaining cells uh, the body can handle it, can, can knock out the remaining cells. Uh, if you had a very sensitive method, a patient could be followed regularly 
to see that those rare cells are going down in abundance. And if they come up above a clinically determined level, then the person can be uh, then given drugs to help fight the cancer. Uh, but to do that, you need a very sensitive method. Uh, there's a, another reason to have the sensitive method of detecting cancer cells, early detection. If a patient is being treated with drugs for a cancer that they have, we know that uh, mut further mutations can occur in cancer cells that make them resistant to the drugs. Right now, you only become aware of those mutations after the cells that contain the mutation have become very abundant. It would be terrific if there was a really extraordinarily sensitive uh, means of assessing uh, the abundance of cancer cells which are resistant to the drugs that are being treated so that at a very early stage you can change the treatment regimen and put in a drug that will work. Uh, lastly, uh, people can be born having inherited genes uh, which give them a propensity to develop cancer. Uh, these mutant genes like the BRCA genes aren't, aren't genes that cause cancer per se, but they are defective genes that are, are not good at repairing other mutations that can occur uh, throughout the body. So the other mutations are the ones that cause cancer. And in particular, uh, for instance, if you inherit the BRCA genes, uh, there's a, you have a strong propensity to develop ovarian cancer or breast cancer if you are a woman. And right now, uh, if you do nothing, uh, you only become aware that a cancer has occurred in your body at a time when there are substantial cancer cells. Uh, and that it is often too late and a person can die from breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So uh, many people uh, have prophylactic breast removal and removal of ovaries to prevent their getting cancer because they've inherited these genes. How much better it would be if there was an extraordinarily sensitive method that could detect the mutations that mean that somewhere in your body uh, cells have arisen, cancer cells have arisen that can call, cause breast cancer or cause ovarian cancer. But the detection is so early that then you can treat with drugs effectively. And this would mean that people would not have to have surgical removal of breasts and ovaries. And, and these are just a few examples of having a technique for the very early detection of cancer would make a huge change in people's lives. Uh, the thing that has made all of this uh, even more exciting is that there is a realization that cancer cells, uh, when they occur, divide rapidly, but also die rapidly through apoptosis or necrosis. And when a cancer cell dies, the, uh, the components of that cell, which are broken down enzymatically, end up in blood plasma. So the genes, some of which will bear the mutations characteristic of cancer, uh, the genes, the DNA of the genes is digested into relatively small fragments that end up uh, in, the, in the plasma of the bloodstream. So there is now great interest in simply taking a blood sample called a liquid biopsy and looking for the mutations, for DNA fragments containing the mutations that are characteristic of, uh, of cancer. Uh, these mutations can not only indicate that cancer has occurred somewhere in the body, uh, the identity of which mutations are there can determine the prognosis for cancer, what type of cancer it is, can determine whether uh, metastasis can occur, can identify which drugs are likely to work uh, against the cancer. And so since taking a blood sample is so much uh, simpler, less intrusive than taking a, a physical biopsy of, of say, uh, a lung or a, a liver, uh, taking a liquid biopsy, a blood sample, 
is so much more attractive. However, uh, in the plasma, in the, in the DNA fragments in the plasma are not only fragments of cancer cells, but uh, fragments of regular cells all throughout the body, normal cells. And there's far more DNA fragments from normal cells than from cancer cells, especially if you want to have very, very early detection of, of cancer. Then the, uh, the cancers, the, the DNA fragments containing mutation are going to be extremely rare. And, and there can be a, a, a hundred thousand or a million times more uh, normal DNA fragments. And, and, and furthermore, the only difference between a normal DNA fragment and a DNA fragment from a cancer cell is, is quite often just a single nucleotide polymorphism. So uh, the challenge that our lab has been working on uh, is to be able to uh, develop methods that can be used in clinical assays that will selectively identify these very rare mutations associated with cancer. Uh, we haven't done clinical assays. We're only developing the method, but I want to talk about that. And, and the methods that we use, are developing uh, utilize the polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction uh, can, I, can take a DNA fragment from a particular gene and amplify that fragment uh, millions, if not billions of fold so that you have a large number of copies of the target DNA fragment. And uh, then using the copies, you can identify whether those copies contain a uh, mutation or don't contain a mutation. Uh, our approach is to develop a means by which only the mutant DNA fragments can serve as templates for generating copies that the normal DNA fragments cannot be amplified, cannot be copied exponentially. And the way we have, uh, or what we have been doing is uh, developing specialized primers for initiating the synthesis of the copies of the target DNA. And uh, these primers are designed to only initiate the copying of DNA on a mutant and not on a, a normal fragment, even though the normal fragments are much more abundant. Now, let, let me give you an idea of what the problem is that we're facing. Uh, here are two conventional PCR assays. Uh, in, in this case, one assay, the, the one with, uh, in, shown in green, is uh, the amplification of uh, one million wild-type uh, molecules to begin with. And uh, uh, there's a primer in there, a regular PCR primer, that's about 20 nucleotides long. You see that little circle in the upper left-hand corner of the slide there? That particular nucleotide out of the 20 uh, does not match the wild type, but does match the mutant. So uh, as, uh, the second reaction that's shown in this slide uh, is a separate reaction started with one million mutant templates. And you see that gets amplified also. And there's really no distinction between the, the mutant amplification and the wild type amplification, because whether 20 nucleotides of the primer bind to the mutant template or, or 19 bind to the wild type template, uh, both primers, uh, both situations will cause there to be uh, very efficient amplification. What, what we've done instead is we've designed uh, uh, a new type of primer, which is schematically shown in the upper left-hand corner uh, of the slide. And uh, what, it, what this primer does is it takes the, a normal primer, say 20, 24 nucleotides long, uh, serves two functions. One, uh, at the 60 degree temperature of the uh, annealing temperature of the PCR reaction, the a, a conventional primer is designed to bind only to the gene of interest. 
That is, anything that doesn't have an almost perfect match to those 20 nucleotides, uh, all the other genes, human genes, uh, are not likely to cause the primer to bind to those uh, um, templates. The, the primer can only bind to uh, almost perfectly matched uh, uh, the pr uh, target. Uh, but the primer, a conventional primer, also serves to initiate the synthesis of the amplicon at its three prime end. And what, what uh, we've done in our laboratory is to separate those two functions. So uh, let me use the little uh, tool here that I have, uh, if I can find it. Uh, let's see, I don't see it. Uh, in, in any case, uh, the, the, the primer is broken into two parts. On the left is uh, a part that does seek out and bind to the gene of interest, but it's separated by uh, something shown by this half circle from a much shorter little primer part, which we call the foot. And uh, the foot is designed to uh, bind to the mutant template, but not to the wild type template. Now, normally, if you had a very small primer, say, six or seven nucleotides long, and you used it hopefully only to bind to the mutant and it will mismatch the wild type uh, at 60 degrees. This little, little primer would hardly bind to anything. And if it, it, it had, would have 20,000 different targets in the human genome to bind to, it wouldn't be specific. But by linking a, uh, uh, the left-hand side of the primer, which seeks out the right gene, to a very short right-hand side of the primer, which is designed to only bind to the mutant and separating those two parts by that curved part, then you get a, a selective PCR primer. So the, this slide shows the result of using such a primer. If we use, if we have 1 million mutant templates present, you see you get a sort of standard strong amplification of the 1 million target molecules, that's the red line. But if instead you do a parallel experiment with 1 million wild type templates, where the only difference between the mutant and the wild type is a single nucleotide polymorphism, there is a delay of approximately uh, 20 cycles of amplification. Two to the 20 is a million. It's one one millionth as likely to be amplified. So uh, that's extraordinary. So let me show you uh, how this works. Um, here is a schematic of the operation of a super selective primer. So on the left side, you see what happens if the, uh, the super selective primer shown in purple binds to a target template. Uh, the long sequence on the left we call the anchor sequence. The curved purple sequence is the bridge sequence. It's not complementary to the uh, template strand. So you see there's a little, uh, curve in the black template strand. And then there's this little foot that is only a few nucleotides long. And uh, if you look at the arrows, if, if uh, an interrogating nucleotide in the foot, the little G there, binds, uh, is complementary to the mutation, the C, then the foot will bind to the template. And the three prime end of that foot can be extended to begin the process of amplification. Whereas if you look on the right side, if uh, the, there's a wild type template, it contains an A instead of a C, the G is not, does not form a base pair with an A, that uh, reduces the probability significantly of the foot binding to the template. And it, it basically does not bind and amplification does not occur. Uh, here's a more detailed uh, look at a super selective primer. Uh, the red sequence is the anchor sequence, which binds to the, uh, selectively binds to the gene of interest at the 60 degree annealing temperature. The blue arched sequence is the artificial bridge sequence, which is not related to the template at all, and is designed not to uh, bind to uh, uh, the corresponding uh, section of the template uh, fragment. And then in green on the right is the foot sequence with the interrogating nucleotide at the next to the last uh, position of the foot. 
Uh, the PCR conditions are quite normal. Uh, they're shown uh, below. Uh, also on this slide, uh, we have a code that shows the structure of the primer. It's written in blue just below the anchor, 2414-14511. Uh, that means that the anchor sequence is 24 nucleotides long. The bridge sequence in the primer is 14 nucleotides long. And the corresponding segment of the template uh, called the intervening sequence uh, to which the bridge does not bind, but it separates the place where the anchor primer binds to the template and where the foot potentially can bind to the template. Uh, so uh, the result is that if you use a primer like this and it finds a mutant target, uh, there are really two hybrids. There's a 24 long hybrid where the anchor part of the primer binds to the template. And there's uh, in this case, uh, a seven long hybrid where the foot binds to the mutant template. But in between there's a bubble formed by the, uh, the artificial bridge sequence and uh, I'll go back and, and formed by the intervening sequence in the template, which is the black curved part. Okay. There's something very neat about using these artificial super selective primers. So this diagram that you have on the screen shows what happens when a super selective primer does bind to a mutant template. You can see the bubble formed, uh, the, so red on top, black on the bottom, bubble on the top of the uh, diagram of the three, and the uh, uh, foot binding, and the, the foot will then be extended. That's the dotted dashed line, generating an amplicon. In the next round of synthesis, that is after the uh, resulting uh, double-stranded molecules are melted apart and the temperature is brought back down to the annealing temperature, now that amplicon, which was generated, which includes the super selective primer sequence, serves as a template for a conventional reverse primer, linear reverse primer, which is shown in blue in the middle diagram. And uh, during that next round of synthesis, the, the blue primer is extended by copying the template to which it is bound. That's the dotted blue line. But here's the neat thing. When the conventional reverse primer copies the amplicon made of, uh, copies the amplicon that includes the whole sequence of the super selective primer. Then the amplicon made in dotted blue lines there is a perfect copy of the entire super selective primer sequence. So now if you go down to the diagram at the bottom of this figure, which is now the third cycle of amplification, you see that the super selective primer now is completely complementary to that blue amplicon. And so the purpose of this slide is to illustrate the point that the selective step, whether amplicons get made or not, the selective slep step of copying mutant templates, but not copying wild type templates that differ by only a single nucleotide polymorphism, occurs only on the, the template molecules present in the original sample being tested. Once amplicon gets made by a super selective primer, then those amplicons are exponentially amplified in the conventional manner, exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Every cycle of amplification doubles the number that are there, making many, many copies of the target. Uh, so uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, so let me show you how this works in practice. Uh, this shows an experiment that illustrates, uh, illustrates the working of a super selective primer. Let me say a little something about how these uh, model experiments were generated. Uh, first of all, we chose as a target uh, DNA molecules containing the EGFR mutation L858R. It's a mutation that's uh, related to whether drugs will work or not work in uh, certain types of lung cancer. 
it's kind of irrelevant for the test what it actually does. So we, pre we prepared a plasmid containing this mutant gene. And we also prepared plasmids containing the wild type gene that did not have the mutation in it. Uh, these plasmids were digested with a restriction enzyme. So it creates fragmented DNA. That's similar to the kind of fragments that we would expect to find in, in a liquid biopsy in, in, in plasma. And uh, then we carried out experiments using uh, different mixtures of mutant and wild type. So let's take them one at a time. So, so oh yes, and uh, we detect the amount of amplicons made with uh, something called cyber green, S-Y-B-R. And it's a small molecule that is not very fluorescent, but when double strands are made by a, an amplicon being copied, uh, the cyber green uh, intercalates into the uh, double-stranded amplicon and becomes brightly fluorescent. So uh, on the y-axis is the fluorescence of the uh, cyber green, and on the x-axis is the number of thermal cycles that have been completed. So let's look at each of these reactions. There are uh, eight reactions shown here. The blue reaction is a control. It's just everything's there except for uh, there was no template DNA at all. You see nothing, nothing happens. Uh, no primer dimers, no, nothing false. The green result shows a reaction initiated with one million wild type templates. And it is suppressed so much that the signal only begins to appear above background uh, after the 40th cycle, uh, thermal cycle has been completed. Then there are uh, six samples, all of which do contain 1 million wild type template molecules, but different numbers of mutant template molecules. And what you see is every sample that contains mutant molecules, in addition to wild type, comes up sooner. It comes up sooner because the mutant molecules are copied fairly efficiently by the super selective primers, whereas the wild type molecules are not. Uh, moreover, you can see that the more mutant molecules you start out with, uh, the sooner uh, you reach an amount that comes up above the background. And this is a very important principle. Uh, th these are real-time PCR assays, and uh, the way that they're analyzed is as follows. Uh, the dotted line shows you uh, uh, sort of an amount above background. And uh, the machines, the uh, spectrofluorometric thermal cyclers that carry out PCR assays uh, have computer programs that can uh, analyze these uh, uh, real-time curves and identify at what cycle uh, a significant number of amplicons are made. That's called the threshold cycle or, or CT. And so the, where each of these real-time curves crosses that dotted line, uh, if you look down from that cross, that's the threshold cycle. And there's a really neat relationship between threshold cycle and how many target molecules were present. Uh, and uh, this is it. Uh, it turns out that if you plot the threshold cycle on the y-axis and you plot the logarithm of the number of mutant templates on the uh, x-axis, you get a straight line. And this relationship that the, the threshold cycle that occurs in a PCR assay is inversely linearly proportional to the log of the number of template molecules in the original sample. Uh, this was introduced by our own laboratory in 1989 for exponential uh, amplification assays. And it is the basis of real-time PCR assays and assays that are designed to detect how many target molecules are present in a sample being analyzed. So uh, you can see that it's a pretty good straight line. Uh, there's a small discrepancy, seems down uh, log one, that means only 10 molecules in the presence of 1 million wild type molecules. It's a little bit off uh, from the straight line. 
And if we look a little closer, I, I'm going to add into this plot the threshold cycle of the sample that was pure 1 million wild type uh, templates. And you see that's, that's only a little above the threshold cycle that we got with uh, a mixture of a million wild types and 10 mutants. So it's really possible that the sort of earlier, slightly earlier CT of the sample with 10 mutants was actually caused by some of the wild type molecules uh, generating amplicons. Okay, so we wanted to study the design of uh, primers so that we could get as perfectly a straight line as possible, being able to clearly indicate, even if you had as few as 10 molecules in a million of uh, mutant and, and 10 molecules in the presence of uh, a million wild types. So these experiments were all done with a 24, 14, 14, 511 primer. Uh, what the next, the next things I'm gonna show you is what happens if we change that 511 foot and make it longer or shorter. And so here's the result if you make it longer. And you see, if you look both at the real time plot and at the log plot, uh, real problems arise when there are only 10 or 100 molecules of mutant. The wild type is not sufficiently suppressed with a longer foot. On the other hand, if you make a shorter foot, like 411, and, and uh, the log plots are shown here for three different designs of a super selective primer. The green results is the 611 foot, which wasn't very good. The 511 was uh, the original one, just a little bit off, but the 411 really worked best. So the interesting thing is when you have a 411 foot, you're really making a very small hybrid, a very weak hybrid. And yet, when you make a weak hybrid, this would be six nucleotides long. Uh, al although the getting started happens later, that's why there's a, a higher CT for all of these samples, uh, identical samples, but using the 411 primer. Uh, when you get that weak hybrid, there seems to be better discrimination against the uh, wild type. Okay. Uh, I also, we also studied the location of the interrogating nucleotide. Uh, the reason we put the interrogating nucleotide at the next to last position is we assumed that if, uh, if a super selective primer binds to the wild type and the next to last uh, nucleotide in the foot doesn't bind to the template, it's not complementary to the corresponding nucleotide in the template, that the terminal base pair will also not be able to form. So in the case of this 411 foot, the mutant would have a six long foot hybrid, but the wild type would have only a four long foot hybrid. So uh, four versus six is probably more discriminatory, is more discriminatory than say with the 611 foot where you have eight versus six. Uh, six versus four is greater ratio. So we did experiments putting that uh, interrogating nucleotide at different positions within the same length, seven nucleotide long foot. And, and these experiments, in each case, we ran two reactions. One initiated with one million wild types, uh, that's shown in green, and in the other, uh, one million mutants shown in red. And what you can see is uh, the best results occur when the interrogating nucleotide is at the three prime position or next to the penultimate three prime position. Okay. We also investigated uh, the effect of changing the circumference of the bubble. Uh, if you may, I, I mean, there are, are two things that determine whether a hybrid gets formed. Uh, uh, one is the, the the strength of the hybrid that's in thermodynamics, that's called the enthalpy. And, and the other is determined by if a hybrid falls apart, what's the probability that the parts could come back together again? Uh, and and uh, that probability is called entropy. And uh, we reasoned that the bigger the bubble, uh, the greater that, uh, well, actually the lower the probability 
that the foot and the foot target could get together. And, and so uh, here you see uh, the studies done with three different uh, sized bubbles. Uh, the one in green is uh, a bridge of 10 and an inter a intervening sequence of 10. Uh, the one in red is 14, 14, and the biggest bubble of all is shown in blue. And here again, the bigger the bubble, the straighter the log plot. But the less likely it is for uh, things to get started, the less likely it is for that foot hybrid to form. So the CT values are higher. And uh, the last aspect in terms of the design of the bubble is we asked what happens if you change the symmetry of the bubble? So in these five experiments, all of the bubbles have the same circumference. But in the upper left, the bridge sequence is 18 and the intervening sequence is 10. Uh, below that is a 16-12 and a perfectly symmetrical bubble is 14-14. And going on to the right side, then we have uh, a bigger intervening sequence and a smaller bridge. Uh, and, and finally, a very small bridge of 10 but an intervening sequence of 18. And what we see is it does not matter. All that matters is the circumference of the bubble, not the symmetry of the bubble. So through these model experiments using this one particular mutant target, uh, and, and it happened to be a, a rather GC rich target for the foot to bind to, uh, we were able to identify uh, key factors in making there be better discrimination. And, and those uh, factors are have a, a small foot, have a relatively big bubble, put the interrogating nucleotide at the three prime end or next at the penultimate position next to the three prime end, but it does not matter what the symmetry of the bubble is. So incorporating that all together, we made a super selective primer that had a large bubble and a small foot. And you can see the beautiful results that occurred. So uh, given a, a particular target, one can make modifications in, in designing a super selective primer to get a very, very selective PCR reaction that will give you amplicons from a mutant and, and virtually ignore the wild type. Uh, question then arose, uh, what happens if instead of using plasmid targets, we use uh, DNA fragments from the entire human genome. So this is basically uh, a repeat situation, except this time uh, we had wild type DNA uh, and uh, we digested that with the same restriction enzyme to get fragments. And we had mutant DNA, which comes from a particular cell line, H1975. Uh, that's the DNA was extracted and also digested, restriction digested. And so we could make samples uh, containing different amounts of mutant uh, DNA in the presence of DNA from 10,000, DNA fragments from 10,000 wild type cells. And uh, 10,000 is more like genomic data, what you're likely to get in say a 10 ml blood sample, plasma from a 10 ml blood sample. And, uh, you see that we did very well using a 24, 14, 14, 511 primer. You get very good results. So basically all the fragments from the rest of the human genome uh, do not alter the results that you get with super selective primers. All that matters is DNA fragments from the mutation you're trying to identify and quantitate. However, uh, we tried a different mutation, a BRAF V600E mutation, another one associated with uh, cancer. But this time, the target sequence for the foot of the primer was AT rich. And we got very beautiful results just using a sort of 1414 bubble and a, a 511 foot. We didn't have to go to the extremes for the GC that we did with the GC-rich EGFR mutation. Uh, in fact, we did it even one further uh, using this particular target. We, we tried 10 million wild type uh, copies and uh, different amounts of mutant and got a straight line for the whole thing. So 
What distinguishes this mutation from the ones we used before? Uh, in the model experiments, it was the GC content of the target. Uh, with the BRAF uh, B600E, the target sequence is AT rich, means it's making weaker hybrids. So the general thing here is the weaker the type of hybrid that's made, the better the discrimination. And we'll come back to that. Uh, one uh, more look is uh, using a, a different kind of mutation, an EGFR. Uh, T790M mutation also associated with cancer. Uh, our colleagues in a company, Molecular MD, prepared samples that contained uh, uh, fragmented whole genomic DNA from wild type cells, human cells, and also fragmented whole human DNA uh, from uh, mutant cells, which contain the 790M mutation. And they used these samples to determine the number of T790M target molecules in each sample by uh, droplet digital PCR. And we took the same sample, same volume, and determined the CT value we got for each of these samples. And then we, we put the results on a curve that compared the digital PCR results to the uh, uh, super selective PCR results, and you get a just beautiful, beautiful correlation. It shows that the CT values that we're getting are truly representative of the number of mutant target molecules that are, that are present. Okay, what's going on here? Why does this work? Uh, it turns out, and I won't go into whole detail here, but thermodynamically, the fact that a the foot hybrid shown on the right there with the, near the three prime symbol or the slide. Uh, the, the difference between the probability of forming a perfectly complementary hybrid with the mutant and a, a mismatched hybrid with the wild type thermodynamically cannot account for the effect of million fold difference between the wild type and the mutant. There's something more going on. And what's going on? and why it is that the weakest kinds of hybrids gave the most discriminatory results is that these little foot hybrids that are formed, unlike anchor hybrids, which once they form last for minutes, minutes on end, they just stay there. These little bitty hybrids at 60 degree annealing temperature easily fall apart. Their mean persistence time is less than a second. Their, their, their lifetime is measured in milliseconds. And during the time that they exist, remember they're in solution, they're being knocked around by Brownian motion. They have to bump into a DNA polymerase molecule that has to bind to that foot hybrid so that once bound, it can generate an amplicon. And it has to do that binding before the hybrid dissociates. And it only has milliseconds to do it. And it turns out that the mismatched hybrids made with the wild type, because they're considerably weaker thermodynamically in terms of enthalpy than the perfectly complementary foot hybrids made with the wild type, uh, their mean persistence time is much, much shorter in milliseconds than the persistence time of the wild type hybrid. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly what it is, but what we do know is they tend to form a, fall apart, the, the mismatched ones much before they have a chance to, to find the DNA polymerase. So you have two factors determining whether an amplicon gets made. One is the relative abundance of perfectly complementary hybrids compared to mismatched hybrids with the wild type that are, occur at equilibrium during the annealing stage. But the second is because these the perfectly complementary hybrids uh, persist for a longer time in milliseconds, than the weaker mismatched hybrids with the wild type, uh, their probability of encountering and binding to uh, uh, a DNA polymerase is lower. So it's a combination of both probabilities of how much, uh, how abundant they are and how long they exist that determines the great super selectivity of these primers. And, and finally, you remember that we noticed you got better selectivity with a bigger bubble, bigger circumference. 
And we attribute this to the Brownian motion of the solution uh, pushes on that single-stranded uh, bubble and can actually uh, pull apart the foot hybrids. And it, th those forces are more likely to pull apart the mismatched wild-type hybrid than they are to pull apart the perfectly complementary uh, uh, mutant hybrid. So all these factors uh, contribute towards the selectivity of these primers. And, and the special aspect of these primers to remember is they're very poor primers. They form very, very, the feet form very, very weak hybrids. And that's the key to their selectivity. Now, final, it turns out, uh, it turns out that uh, the most informative assays for assessing a cancer patient are assays that are multiplex assays that will, uh, will look, look at different mutations that are relevant uh, to cancer, things that determine which drugs you should use, what their prognosis is, how abundant they are. And many of these mutations occur in the same gene. So there, there are seven different key KRAS mutations that occur in two adjacent codons. I mean, these mutations may occur in different cells, but their location is within the same or adjacent codons. Same with EGFR mutations and BRAF that uh, we were using. But it turns out that uh, multiplex assays can be performed with super selective primers. And the way we do that is we use uh, another invention in our lab called molecular beacons. Molecular beacons are little probes. The probe sequence is in the, if you, is in the loop of that uh, nucleic acid hairpin shown in the slide. And the probe sequence is embedded within two arm sequences that are unrelated to the probe sequence or the target sequence, but which caused the probe to form this little hairpin. And at the ends of the hairpin, there's a fluorophore and a quencher. And because the fluorophore is next to the quencher, uh, there's no fluorescence. But if the molecular beacon is complementary to a target, for instance, a target amplicon, then it, it prefers to form a hybrid with the target amplicon. Uh, and the rigidity of that long probe target hybrid uh, causes the arms of the molecular beacon to separate, it's also separating the fluorophore from the quencher, and that gives you a bright fluorescent signal. So we can design molecular beacons that bind to the amplicons that are generated by super uh, selective primers. And we can use different molecular beacons for each of the different amplicons made in a, uh, in a, a multiplex super selective primer assay. And each of those different molecular beacons will be labeled with a different colored fluorophore. So I want to finish up by showing you our more recent multiplex assays. And uh, so in this case, we, we prepared an assay which had two different super selective primers for two different mutants, uh, one called BRAF V600E, which we used before, and the uh, uh, new one, uh, BRAF V600R. And in these assays, uh, we have molecular beacons in different colors. Uh, Quasar 670 was the fluorophore for the BRAF V600E, and fluorescine was the fluorophore for BRAF V600R. Uh, and we have two different super selective primers and just shows that it works really well. So what you see here is that uh, in the presence of 10,000 wild type templates, we put in different numbers of BRAF V600R templates and we get the usual spread of CT values. Uh, and yet uh, the BRAF V600E does not interact. The molecular beacon doesn't interact. The amplicons aren't made from the mutant that's not present. Here's the uh, corresponding experiment where we substitute, we made different amounts of BRAF V600E, uh, but put in no BRAF V600R. And uh, here's an experiment in which we had both mutants present and wild type present. This time 100,000 wild type templates and 100,000 BRAF V600E mutants, but different numbers of BRAF V600R mutants. And you see that the Quasar 670 
lights up all 100,000 URAP B600E at exactly the same CT value, whereas separately, the BRAF B600Rs, the CT values reflect the number of targets that are there. And here is the uh, complementary experiment where we kept the BRAF B600R constant at 100,000 copies and put in different numbers of BRAF B600E copies. And you'll see that uh, as controls, wild type only, even though there are these complex multiplex reaction, uh, gave no signal uh, with either molecular beacon. That's the little line, uh, lines at the bottom. Uh, taking the results of these last two slides, uh, just to show you that you get really quantitative results, here are the log plots obtained with, uh, from those assays. So uh, we are uh, very excited by these results. We think that uh, multiplex assays can be developed to look at multiple mutations, perhaps even all seven or eight different KRAS mutations that occur in two codons, each lit up by different colored uh, molecular beacons. And uh, this will allow, uh, uh, allow simple blood samples to be taken uh, and the DNA in the plasma can be analyzed and a physician can get a picture of which mutations are present or absent and if they're present, what their relative numbers are. And this will allow uh, th this, this will allow the patient's situation to be evaluated frequently because blood sample is simple to take and uh, therapy to be adjusted. And the whole purpose is to convert cancer from an often fatal disease to one which can be managed, turn it into a chronic disease, which can be managed by frequently, frequent blood assays. Uh, that indicate the situation and allow changing therapy at an early stage before there are clinical, uh, clinical indications. Uh, what needs to be done now is uh, clinical studies have to be done. We have to use clinical samples. You have to determine how much DNA there really is in plasma samples. Uh, once you have good assays, you have to test it in real world situations. We haven't done that. This is just a method that can be applied, but it's so simple and direct a method, it uses PCR machines that are available for everyone. Uh, so I'll stop there. Uh, let me see if there are some questions that can be answered. Uh, let's see what we have. It says there are no questions available for display. <laughs> That's, uh, that seems good. Uh, I'll ask my uh, colleague, Salvatore Maris, if he's gotten any questions, but otherwise, uh, we are pretty much there. Uh, I will say this, that uh, questions may arise later. Uh, oh, uh, let me, well, let, let me, let me first t tell you this. Questions can be sent to me at this email address, and we will try and answer all those questions as they occur later. So it's fred.kramer at rutgers.edu. And now I want to, uh, show you the people with, who did this work and my colleagues in our laboratory. Uh, this is uh, Salvatore Maras. Uh, he is originally from the Netherlands. Uh, we have been together, I don't know, 16, 17 years, I forget. That might not be accurate. Long time. Uh, here is Deanna Vargas, also been in our lab a long time. She is from the country of Colombia. Uh, all the actual experimental results I've shown were carried out by Deanna. And uh, uh, lastly, here is Sanjay Tiagi. Uh, he and I have shared a lab for uh, 28 years and uh, it's been very productive and uh, uh, it's, it's just really been fun to do this work. Uh, and the fact that the work that we do, which is, is almost like art, it's pleasurable, uh, that it might have real clinical uh, advantages is just wonderful. Uh, Okay, I think that that's it. I don't think we have anything further. And so we can, uh, we can end the seminar there. Since there uh, Dr. Kramer, we, we do have uh, one question that's already come in and I want to remind the, the audience how to submit questions. So I wanna thank you first for that informative presentation. 
Um, so it is time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Kramer, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the send button. We'll answer as many as we can. So let's get started. Our first question is, how are these kinds of rare mutations initially identified? I hope I can be heard. Uh, good. I do not know how they're identified. Uh, we are not a clinical lab. I'm not a clinical person. Uh, we work with molecules, almost like uh, a kindergarten. We design molecules. We're interested in the nucleic acid amplification. The identity of the mutations are provided by people who do clinical studies, who analyze uh, tissue taken from uh, actual cancers at different stages, taken from people who respond or don't respond to drugs and try to correlate with the mutations that are present. Uh, when there are metastases, they look at the uh, metastasized tissue to see what is, what is there. So the identity of the targets is not in our area. We start with identified mutations. But I think here is the main thing. No matter what the identity of the mutation, a super selective primer can be designed to selectively amplify just that mutation. Even if the only difference between the wild type and the mutant is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Not only can it be identified in a, a liquid biopsy sample, hopefully, but it can be quantitated. And the relative abundance of the different mutations should provide meaningful clinical information for modifying therapy uh, personalized for each patient. And that could make a big change uh, in cancer and how we treat it. That's my answer. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Kramer for his presentation. Do you have any final comments, Dr. Kramer? Only that, uh, only that, uh, I, I, okay. Only that this approach using PCR, polymerase chain reaction, since instruments for carrying out PCR assays are, are present throughout the world, there, there, there are, are tens of thousands of these instruments. And since these assays can run on any of those instruments, uh, this represents a much easier entry towards getting information from patients. Some um, alternative approaches in, involve sequencing the, uh, the DNA fragments found in plasma. And uh, that's costly, complex. There aren't as many instruments to do it. Specialized labs have to do it. What we're looking for is something so simple that uh, a sample can be taken, uh, in inserted perhaps into a disposable cassette that's put in the uh, instrument. The instrument runs the assay, computers analyze the results, and print the answer on the screen so that a nurse can take a sample and get an answer. And not only that, the answer that is obtained, uh, the, the pr computer programs can be built to suggest appropriate therapy based on the multiple mutant inf mutation information that is observed. So we're looking for low cost, simple assays that uh, can be carried out by uh, uh, unspecialized people and it can be used worldwide. That's what, and that's why we're doing this. That's, that's my final comment. And, and I thank all those that uh, attended. Thank you once again, Dr. Kramer. Just a reminder, if you wish to obtain the credits for today's session, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to the Continuing Education page where you can select a speaker, click on the CE CME button, and be guided through the process to obtain your certification. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today's live event. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>